In two previous videos, Michael Kalperhoff of the IC School at EPFL explored applications of the Fourier transform and discussed recent breakthroughs in Fourier transform computations. So the, the, the two results that I mentioned about a sa minimizing sample complexity and runtime complexity, uh, these are actually two distinct algorithms. So the best known result for runtime achieves about k log squared and runtime and the same sample complexity. Uh, the best known result for sample complexity achieves k log n samples, which is optimal, but runs in time linear in the length of the signal. So as of now, we don't really have sort of the ideal algorithm that we would like to have. It's not clear if that is possible. Is can we reconstruct the dominant k coefficients of the signal in time k log n? We know that we cannot do any better than that, and this would be the, the holy grail. This would close the problem under the classical assumption. We're not quite there yet, and so there's some still more exciting algorithmic techniques to be developed. Given how prominent Fourier transforms are in our information age, I think it's fair to say that whoever finds this holy grail of Fourier transform computation, that is an algorithm that's optimal both in terms of time and sample complexity, will be gloriously hailed by many. This is a huge open problem in the field of Fourier transform computation. However, there are many more open problems. Uh, yes, definitely. So, uh, so all that I have said so far applies to this, to this classical assumption where I'm saying my input is a signal x and I hope or think that the dominant k coefficients uh, capture most of the energy of x. But I don't really make any assumptions on where these dominant coefficients lie. And indeed, as I mentioned, the way sparse FFT algorithms work is by first randomizing the spectrum. So once you do that, the k-dominant coefficients are basically all over the place. They're uniformly spread across the frequency domain. On the other hand, in many applications, the signals that actually arise in practice, they're not only sparse, that they satisfy further structural constraints. So for instance, in JPEG, one can think that most of the coefficients would probably be low frequency. Uh, and there, there are more sort of models that uh, have been studied in the literature uh, that practical signals satisfy. This is uh, known as, this is related to work in compressed sensing and to a subfield of compressed sensing that has been extremely successful. This is known as model-based compressed sensing. One one thinks of a signal that one is trying to acquire as not only as being k-sparse, that is being dominated by a few coefficients, but also as satisfying some sort of a model that is uh, having more structural properties. We discussed a little bit the underlying Fourier structures of images and sounds in previous videos. Images typically have a lot of translation symmetries, while small chunks of images are usually remarkably smooth, which corresponds to low frequencies. Music is usually made of a handful of dominant prescribed frequencies that correspond to the notes that are being played, and these notes are usually also accompanied with tones that are characteristic of the instruments that are being played. Tapping into the underlying structures of the signals to be processed before they are processed could potentially allow for the design of more optimized algorithms. Let's see an example. So here's one example. It is often the case that the signals that we have in practice have a number of dominant Fourier coefficients, but these coefficients are also, also often clustered in blocks. And the number of blocks is substantially smaller than the number of Fourier coefficients in total. So now the question becomes, well, can we design sublinear time sparse FFT algorithms that are able to exploit this further structure to reduce the sample complexity and to reduce the runtime? Let's say we have k naught blocks, each of which contain k1 dominant Fourier coefficients. This means that we now have k naught times k1 dominant Fourier coefficients, which leads to a time and sample complexity of the order of k0 times k1 times polylog in n. This is good, but could we do better? A recent result by uh, colleagues at EPFL and myself uh, shows how to do that. So we, we have recently been able to obtain the first algorithm for structured sparse FFT, if you will and in particular for this block-sparse model. In a 2017 paper, Professor Kaplarov, with the collaboration of Sever, Scarlett, and Zandier, provided an algorithm that strictly improves on sample complexity 
and runs in sublinear time. This is very cool. But at the same time, there's lots of other structural assumptions that have been studied in literature and have, have been shown as have been demonstrated to be very efficient in recovering signals that arise in practice. Now, the very exciting new direction in, in the field is can we design new techniques for sparse FFT that will allow us to exploit structured sparsity while running in sublinear time? So I want to design sparse FFT algorithms that will run in time k log n, or maybe even less, if the signal satisfies interesting models that, that arise in practice. So if you want to contribute to the field, a good idea could be to optimize Fourier transform algorithms for signals with typical structures. I'll let you figure out the details of your upcoming breakthrough in your own time. So at the moment we have a fairly good understanding of the problem uh, under the sparsity assumption alone. So we have k log squared n runtime, k log n sample complexity. Although even this is not entirely satisfactory because we would like to understand if we can get k log n runtime and sample complexity at the same time. Interestingly, even under this classical assumption, uh, there are still very exciting open problems. So for instance, the results that I mentioned have the stated runtime and sample complexity only for one-dimensional signals. That is, imagine having n points, but this is a signal on, on a line. In other words, the sparse Fourier transforms that we've been discussing in the last two videos are particularly well suited for time series. But a lot of interesting signals to be studied are not necessarily time series. In uh, many practical applications, we have signals that are higher dimensional. Images are two-dimensional signals, and uh, many three-dimensional signals, and even somewhat higher dimensional signals, arise in medical imaging applications and, and other, other areas. The surprising, uh, surprising property of uh, currently known sparse Fourier transform algorithms is that they are fairly sensitive to the dimensionality of the signal. So, if you will, they suffer from so a curse of dimensionality. In fact, their runtime blows up exponentially with the dimension. So one very exciting question to, uh, to, uh, to answer is whether or not one can design other algorithmic techniques with new, more powerful, or more general algorithmic techniques that will get rid of this curse of dimensionality. So the third big question raised by Professor Kaplarov is the following. Could we design efficient sparse Fourier transforms for 2D, 3D, or even 4D signals? So one can view this current state of affairs as uh, as as a hint that perhaps there's other more powerful techniques than the ones that we're currently using uh, to be discovered. And this is very exciting because these could lead to powerful theoretical advances and hopefully also improvements in practice. And Fourier anal analysis is a remarkable method of basically decomposing images down into the component parts and looking, looking at them. It's like sort of almost particle physics for images, where you're breaking it down into its component parts and looking at the relationship between those various components and how they build up an image. This algorithm runs in time about log squared n, so it doesn't even look at the entire signal.